start with uh, Catherine Ustova, the head of the uh, IR Dante, to give us the great vision of the end. Um, we will give her a few minutes as she does that. Thank you. Well, first of all, apologies that I'm standing here again. Uh, that was not the plan. The plan was that the uh, chairman of the European NRNPC, uh, Vasilis Maglanis, would be speaking here today, but uh, he needed to be in Greece during this week, so he, he was not able to come and, and kindly told me that I should be giving the presentation on behalf of Jeant here. Um, as I'm not the chairman, but I'm just one of the many activity leaders in, uh, in Jeant, my vision is maybe a little uh, limited, my vision is probably also a bit clouded, uh, but I'll do the best that I can uh, to present to you um, the way we in the sort of middle management of Jean see this project develop. So when you saw me talking this morning, I'm standing in front of you as the project manager of Africa Connect. Now I'm standing in front of you uh, with a completely European hat on. Uh, I'm standing in front of you as the person responsible for international relations in, in the Jean network, one of the activity leaders of the GM, GM3 project and uh, so forget about the morning's presentation as well we much more down to earth this is you know the daily bread and butter of what I do in Europe so from Africa I give you go home now and I tell you about Europe so this is the GM partners partnership to start with we have 34 project partners and if you look at the European Union the European Union has 27 union members so, over the years, as the European Union has been growing from 12 members to 16 members to 20, 25, 27 members, equally, uh, the GEAT consortium has been growing. Um, GEAT is now 11 years old. Uh, we started in 1993 with a background called EuropaNet, which was a very humble affair. We then had a background called 1034, 10155, and then the first GEAT network. So this is shared in the third generation with 34 partners. We have new associate uh, members, um, which is in the eastern part of Europe, Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, and Moldova are associate members, as well as um, Macedonia, Montenegro, and, uh, and Serbia. So the network is growing. This is the topology of Europe. The network itself looks like this, like this. So it, um, we interconnect 38 European countries. Um, before it was just 34 partners because the Nordic region is covered by our partner regional network Nordinet. So it's 34 European countries are interconnected in JAM. And all that you can see here black is a dark fiber network. It's a dark fiber backbone where we can have um, 10, 20, 40 gigabit capacity between these hubs. JAM is a hybrid network. That means we don't only run IP. Uh, traffic, but we also can make what we call the GM Plus service available, which is switch point-to-point -point circuits between individual locations across Europe, mainly on the dark fiber background, but also on those links that are in um, purple here, which are 10 gigabit links, but also on the yellow, on the red links, which are two and a half gigabit links. So this is quite a big backbone, and uh, also we have what we call the GM Lambda service. Uh, which is a wavelength service where individual countries can buy 10 gigabit late wavelengths from us for their dedicated use for dedicated projects that they need to serve. So this is what we have today and this is the connectivity aspect of GEAT and I want to leave that aside for the moment because what makes GEAT interesting and what makes GEAT interesting also for you is really this. We're all different. Every NREN is different. And if you look at GEAT as a sort of the little train here leading the train, this is the GEAT, the European backbone, and we have a little elephant, which are the individual different NRANs, but they have campus networks behind them as well, and we have end users at the end of it. So really, GEAT is, when we talk GEAT, we always talk multi domain. We never can have anything running in just one domain, because anything that we make available is from end user to end user. And always has to go from, from the end user, the campus, to the end ramp, to Jean, back to a different end ramp, a different campus, and a different end user. And this is why multi-domain services in Europe become increasingly important. And I think 
If you ask for the vision, what's going to be important for Europe? An increased use, implementation of multi-domain services. Yes, life is like a box of chocolate. And uh, this really means that our multi-domain services that we implement across the European backbone, from country to country, they have a different flavor. Some have a nuts inside, some have a bit of nougat, others are more sugary, others have uh, caramel or anything else, coconut. But in the end, they're all based on chocolate, and in the end, they all need to fit into one box. That's the important thing. Because we can't harmonize, we can't standardize completely on one multi-domain service across all of the European domains. It's impossible. It will never work. What we need to make sure is everything is interoperable. The different flavors are taken care of and the box fits. So really, if you look at it, what does that mean for the GEAN service area? It means really that we, we talk about the GEAN service area quite fluently up to the end user. We will completely respect the, the, the fact that in between there's different pieces of chocolate and they taste different, a little bit, but they're all based on chocolate. They can all talk to each other. They are all from the same box. So if you look at this, uh, the Jean service area, the backbone that I showed you before really fits here into the middle. It's the backbone and the global links, the backbone capacity, the 36 European elements connected. And we have around that, you know, thousands of campuses that receive connectivity via their NRAM. They don't receive connectivity via GEAN. <coughs> they receive the connectivity via their NRAM. And then at the end of that, we have uh, identity and roaming services, which we reach towards the end user. So what are these multi-domain services? One thing that we increasingly see is bandwidth on demand. Bandwidth on demand, what is it really? Well, if you want to talk about the point-to-point uh, -point circuits that I talked to you before, that uh, is the GEAN Plus circuit, where I can ask for dedicated point-to-point -point circuit across the GEAN network. For me personally, bandwidth on demand means I can ask for this quickly, it will be put, it will be put in, sorry about that, the service will be put in dynamically, and I can tear that service down again within three hours, four hours. So it means additional quick campus connectivity if and when that campus needs it, rather than static services that you implement once between two campuses and they remain there for a year. This is cost effective. This is very much in favor of the researcher who has to handle you know, his research budget and might not want to pay too much for the connectivity. As you see, you know, these are here the different flavors of the chocolate box. Some of us, you know, use Autobahn for that. And that's the technology behind it. It's not the service, it's just the technology behind it. Others use Oscars, which is a, an American uh, flavor of the same thing. The important thing is that it's interoperable. It needs to work. They need to talk to each other. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to standardize on NSI, which is a uh, OGF, um, standardized protocol for bandwidth on demand and we work closely with the Open Grid Forum to ensure that we, we can all be interoperable today and in the future. <coughs> identity, identity federations are important. Edugain is uh, coming up, is getting increasing coverage throughout Europe and um, Edugain is a uh, is a service to enable trustworthy exchange of information related to identity authentication and authorization between the GEAN partners and increasingly also uh, outside the GEAN domain. And it is important to be able to trust each other and to have identity federations across Europe so that our users really have uh, the possibility to use separate services and are identified and authenticated no matter where they are in Europe and for whatever service they are using. One of the other things that in Europe we increasingly talk about is multi-domain monitoring. As a user, you really want to know what is happening in the network. And you don't, know, you don't only want to see your own campus network. You want to see the NRAM, you want to see the GEM, you want to see the global connectivity. So Persona is really a, a possibility to do that. It allows you to have a close view on the network across various domains 
where no, normal measurement tools would only look at your individual domain. But you don't want that, that's not good enough. You need to be looking beyond. Where's the mistake? Where's the problem? Is it in my domain, my neighbor's domain? Is it further away? You want to be able to identify. But Solar really is a tool that gives a lot of control to users and also network operation centers. And Sona is, again, one of those services where we are making sure that it is not just within Europe. Sona as a, as a technology has been developed uh, over the years really in very close collaboration with our uh, US partners as much as our partners in Brazil. And two flavors, again, you know, the box of chocolate, two flavors have developed. One is called Persona PS, the other one is called Persona MDM. And it doesn't really matter because they're interoperable. They're fully interoperable and that is, you know, all that is about. It needs to fit into the same box of chocolate. We have 43 measure measurement points across Geant, where we can see the multi-domain effect of uh, the, the traffic in the network. And we have eight measurement points now in ESNet, which is one of the major backbones in the US. And we have nine measurement points with our friends at Internet2. And this is very good if you have showcases like International Dance and you want to really make sure your network is performing completely right. You can go end to end from a site in Europe to a site in the US and make sure everything is fine. And if there's an issue, you can pinpoint it very quickly. So, GM today and tomorrow is an integral component of the European e infrastructure. It's innovation, leadership, and network technologies. It's per se a multi domain environment, it needs to remain in the environment, and it's designed for international collaboration. And before I end, I just want to quickly give you a view on this international collaboration. This is the GM backbone there in the middle, and this is the current connectivity that we offer to other world regions. And this is the beauty for Africa Connect, connecting to GEA, because we will, we will allow you transit to all other world regions. So once you get connected here from Africa, through this peering that we have with you in London, you get the rest of the world. It's all yours. I talked about Africa this morning. I'm not going to speak much about Clara because La Clara is no longer, and that is a big success, it's no longer a Dante managed project, it is a Latin American managed project. But that also means that um, in the Dante presentation that I'm giving here, it's a bit difficult for me to go into the detail of Clara. So I'm just going to say to you that Clara is up and running, it's probably the big, biggest success story that we had in this development aid project. It covers, um, I think, 15 countries in Latin America these days fully operational network, but let's just see what happens in other world regions because this is quite interesting. So your northern neighbors in the Mediterranean, they have been receiving funding from the European Commission since 2003, and we just started the new UMED Connect project on the 1st of September. The difference, and I think that's also quite important for you to know, we spoke this morning about Africa Connect being 8% funded. UMED Connect is only 36% uh, funded now. So really, the way towards sustainability in Northern Africa for the European Commission was to reduce its involvement step by step and to increase the involvement of the North African countries. <coughs> you have here the, the names of the Emirates that are connected. We're also connecting Central Asia, and this for Dante was quite a challenge because Central Asia is a, is a difficult area to work uh, with. Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan have not yet joined, but they will join in the future. Um, so we have here, we have a network that uh, pretty much connects um, from Central Asia to the Tain Pop, which is in, in South Asia. So this, connect, this network doesn't connect to Jean directly, but it connects into the Tain network and from there back to Jean. Why was this done? The cost effectiveness. This is the TAIN network, and it's probably the biggest network we have. And this is um, uh, covering all of uh, Asia Pacific and South Asia, as you can see. The connectivity you see here is, is more limited than we have in JAN. So we have um, 2.5 gigabit links that are connecting the main hubs between China, Hong Kong, 
Singapore, and then uh, to Europe, onwards to Europe. Uh, and the rest of the connectivity is around 622 megabits. This network only works because the big countries in this region, Japan, Korea, Singapore, have supported it from the very beginning as much as Australia and China. The network operation center of this network is in China and in very close contact with the Jian Nok in Cambridge. Yes, and that will be just right. Um, Jian also has direct connectivity to China. Uh, this is uh, very important to us in Europe. Uh, China is for I think for many world regions today, uh, an important not only commercial partner, but also a research partner. So we are very happy to receive uh, funding, specific funding from the European Commission again, but also from the Chinese partners, CIANET and CSTNET, for connectivity specifically be between uh, the GEAN network um, in Copenhagen and, and the network in Beijing, um, the, the Chinese networks in Beijing. We are hoping to upgrade the current 2.5 gigabit links to 10 gigabits in the future. So what's tomorrow? Tomorrow, many smart people have been thinking in Europe, what's going to happen tomorrow? There was a, uh, a GER expert group has been put together uh, by the European Commission to actually advise the Commission on how they should be spending their money for, for GER in 2020. And uh, this Knowledge Without Borders is a very interesting booklet, so I'll give you the link here, have a look at it. But basically what it says is that uh, GEM 2020 is a European Communications Commons, is where talent anywhere will be able to collaborate with talent everywhere. So the talented people in Europe are supposed to globally interoperate, uh, collaborate with their peers, their talented peers all around the world, really forming a global research community. They have to have instantaneous and unlimited access to any resource of knowledge, creation, innovation and learning, no matter where. It doesn't matter where. And it should be completely unconstrained by those barriers of the BBC, of the born before computers age, so of the pre-digital world. This is the vision that this Knowledge Without Borders presents. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.